good so welcome everyone if you're watching it on twitch or if you're watching it later on youtube um welcome to the lecture lecture number five already so um i think we have like 13 lectures so we're one third of the way of the whole course so today we will be talking about proteins um that's what we're gonna do but of course like always um we first have to um do the answers. So the overview for today is first do the answers, um, then I will start talking about the history of proteins and how people do um, protein separation and prediction and stuff. Um, we will be talking about structure a lot. So we will be talking about the differences between like primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure of proteins. Um, there will be a part about how to purify proteins and how to identify the different proteins that you are working with. Um, we will do function prediction, protein domains, um, yeah, how do I determine which part of the protein does what. Um, furthermore, we will also talk about protein families and I will try and explain to you guys what the difference is between an orthologue, a paralogue and a xenologue. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of a structure about phylogenetic trees, although phylogenetic trees will come back in a later lecture. Good, so first let's get the answers to the previous assignments. So I hope I have everything set up properly. So these are my answers and unfortunately I forgot to open up the questions. So let me do that as well. So they are in DocX, Bioinformatics and then lecture number four assignments. All right, so um, yeah, number four. So the first things that I asked of you guys is to download the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein RNA molecule. Um, so the um, RNA description of how the spike protein is made um, and download it from NCBI. I showed you guys that last time on stream for the envelope. So it's the same as for the envelope, except for instead of downloading the e-gene, we now downloaded the s-gene. Um, so it's a slightly longer sequence because the spike has more amino acids than the envelope. Um, so the first thing is, is the um, analysis of, uh, uh, oh no, and then uh, predict the secondary function. So um, let me move to um, Firefox and then let's first go to um, NCBI and we go to the gene database right, because we're interested in the gene and not the protein. So um, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. All right, searching, searching, searching. Website is very slow. So here we see the S surface glycoprotein. Um, so this is a gene. You can see the structure of the whole um, sars um, RNA molecule here, so we have the ORF1A and ORF1AB, um, which are the, is the replicase, so that's the thing that copies. Um, then we have the S, which is the spike protein, which causes the entry of the virus into the cell. Uh, we have E and M, which make up the envelope and the membrane, so that's, those are the proteins that make the uh, capsid. And then we have the N, which is the nucleocapsid, which is the thing that surrounds the RNA. Um, but we're interested in the S protein, so um, let's just click on the S protein here. And it's loading a little bit, and then yeah, when we scroll to the back we can see some information, like where it's located. Um, but in this case we're only interested in the sequence, um, so we just click the little FASTA button here. Uh, when we click the FASTA button we will get a overview of the protein. All right. Uh, not the protein, sorry. We will get an overview of the RNA code. Very good. So we just do copy paste and then um, we go to the um, RNA fold web server to predict if there's any secondary structure. So RNA fold. There it is. And we just paste it in. Um, we can set some options, but the default options are fine. And we click proceed. And this will take some time because it's much bigger than the other one. So we'll just skip through the other um, answers. Um, so let's see if it finishes. No. So let's just wait and just go to the microarray analysis. 
Good, so I told you guys that microarrays are these little glass plates which you can use to measure 20,000 genes at the same time. So I gave you an example of something that we did here in our group. Um, so let's just go through the assignment. So first things first, right? If you want to create a little R script, you have to create a new file. Because like in anything that you do, like be it working in a lab or be it a bioinformatician who's sitting behind the computer. Um, we have something which is called kind of a lab book um, when you're working in a lab, but as a computer scientist or as a bioinformatician, of course, the lab book is the code that you create. Um, and generally, of course, these files we put on the version control. So like in the first lecture, we discussed about the uh, version control system and I had you guys set it up. Um, so and normally a file like this for me, it would go under version control, um, and I would just first make a make an empty script, right? So the empty script, of course, will contain a header. So make sure that you always include a header so that you know what the file is for. So in this case, um, it clearly says that these are the answers to the assignments belonging to lecture four. Um, and then I always put my own name there just so that people know that I made it. Um, it's always good to have like a, um, a last modified uh, date or something like that. So head that people know when it was last modified um, so that people can know how out of date something is. So any script that we do in R starts with setting our working directory. And this is kind of important um, and it's kind of the way that I structure all my scripts. It's first setting the working directory and loading um, the data file. So the data file was available on Moodle. You could also get it from my website. Um, so I'm just um, saying go to this folder where I stored the, uh, the data. And of course we will have more data files in uh, upcoming lectures. And in this case the data file is called GSE7765 GPL96 series matrix. All right, so let's go to R and just start copy pasting in the first part and loading it in. Um, so let me guys sh sh let me show you guys the R window. All right, so it loads in quite quickly because it's not the biggest data set in the world. Um, so the first question was is how many samples are in the file and how many mRNAs have been measured uh, using probes? So and the uh, uh, the question also had the hint, right, because samples are in the columns and mRNAs are in the rows. So um, we can just say n col if we want to know how many columns there are. Um, so in this case, when I do n col, it tells me that there are six columns. If I am interested in to see how many rows there are, I can use the n row function um, and just give it the microarray data set. And then it tells me that 22,283 um, probes on the array have been measured. Um, so that's almost one probe for every gene in the genome of the mouse. All right, so then the next step would be, um, and this was, I think, explained also in the assignment. So let me go back to the assignment very quickly. Um, so in the assignment, um, using the box plot function, we can plot the column by ma uh, the matrix by column. Every column will be used as the input for a single box plot. Um, this allows us to compare the different samples. Uh, we, net we need to set two additional parameters so that the labels end up being readable on the plot. Because if you don't do that, then it will take the column names and put them horizontal. But if you put them horizontal, um, you they are overlapping, so you can't read them. Um, so the way that this is done in R, and I think I gave you the whole code, is just say do a box plot. The first um, parameter that we give is the data parameter. So this is the data which it will use. So it will look at this data frame and then for every column start making a box plot. Um, LAS equals 2 means that instead of plotting the things horizontal, can you explain your microarray definition? Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Um, so here we see the read CSV function, right? So the read CSV function loads in a CSV file or a table. Um, so we give it the name of the file that we want to load in. So in this case, it's in this folder and then I have a subfolder called data. So it's in data and then this is the file name. Then I say skip is 66 because we have to skip the initial lines um, and actually let me open up the file for you guys. I think that should be possible in Notepad++. Um, it's not the, the biggest one. So we go there, we go to data and then we go open up the microarray data. So this is how it looks like. 
right? So we first see that there's a whole bunch of um, additional information. And so this is dioxin induced gene expression changes in human breast cancer cells and then it gives you the geo theory that it belongs to um, and so on and so on and it, it gives you like a whole bunch of additional information about um, for example who collected the data um, who do you need to email um, their phone numbers in case you want to call them and and all of these things and have for example there's also supplementary data um, but then you see that the matrix Right, the data itself starts at line 67. So that is why I'm saying here skip is 66, right? Um, because the first 66 lines are not a matrix. They are just additional information about the file that you're currently looking at. The next parameter is header is true. So header is true means um, there is a header, right? So every column has a name. And in this case, for example, the name of the first column is called IDREF. The second column is called GSM188013. All right, so had, if there would not be a header, right, if the file would have, ha would have just started like this and it would not have any names for the column, um, then I would have said header is false. But since there is a header, since there, there is a description uh, or a name for every column, um, I'm saying header is true. Separator is tab, so this is something that when you look into the file and when you use Notepad++ you see that in my case tabs are these little arrows, while if I have spaces those are these little white dots. They are very hard to see probably, um, but there's a difference between a space and a tab. And in Notepad++ if you go to view, and you guys can see that, but on the top you have like this bar right and you have file, edit, search. Um, but if you go to view, then there's an option underneath um, show symbol, and then it says show white space and tab. Um, you can also say show all characters, and now you see that it also gives me these LF things. So these are line feeds, so those are the enter characters in the file. Um, but those are not that interesting. Um, so I just say view and then I go to show symbol and I enable the show white space and tabs. And now I know hey, that, okay, so this is a tab because it's a little arrow and a, a, a space is just, if, if I would do some spaces here, then you see that those are these little yellow dots. Um, they're really clear when you're looking at it yourself. Um, so that's the next parameter and then I say row names equals one and that is because every row has a name, right? So this is probe and this probe is called 1007 underscore s underscore at. And this takes a little bit of practice, like ro loading in files in R is not easy um, because there's like literally hundreds of parameters that you can use. Um, fortunately, this file actually was encoded in the correct way, so for the decimal separator it uses a dot and not a comma, um, which can also be an issue if you're using, for example, a German version of Excel, um, then um, Excel, or at least the German version of Excel, generally prefers the comma for, <coughs> uh, for the separator of the decimals. Right, so we have here the number 15,630, uh, comma, two, um, but R requires commas to be dots to load it in. Um, there's many, many more parameters to the read table function. Um, if you're interested, I think on YouTube, I actually um, chapterized the reading in data lecture already. So that's one of the things that I've been working on in my free time, is making sure that every YouTube video has like these um, bookmarks so that you can just click on reading in data um, and then it directly goes to that part of the video. Um, so that's the that's the um, description of line number eight, right? So it, I give it the data file to load in. I say skip 66 lines because that's not a matrix. That's just additional information like telephone numbers and who collected it. Header is true because we see that it has a column, column names. And I then say row names is one. Um, for saying, well, there are row names huh, because there's there's numeric data in the in the matrix, but hey, you have to, to every row just has its own name. And furthermore, we say separator equals top, and the top character is specified by slash t, um, so that's the uh, the top character. All right. 
Um, here I use the dim function instead of the n row and n call that I just showed you. Um, so dim uh, does more or less the same thing. So let me um, show you how that looks in R. Um, so in R, when you use the dim function, it gives you the dimensions. And the dimensions are, it gives you first the rows and then the columns. So it's 22,283 two, rows and six columns. All right, so let's use the box plot function um, to uh, make a little box plot um, and so that you can see what is happening. So here we see the first plot that we made. So what we can see is that there is um, a very weird distribution, right? Um, we can see that the box plot is, is very squeezed all the way to the bottom and we see that there are literally like hundreds or thousands of outliers on the top. Um, if we want to look at this in a little bit more detail, we can of course make a histogram. Um, so to do that, we would just use the hist function for histogram. And then for example, I want to look at, for example, the first column of the microarray. So the way that I do that is just say, um, give me all the rows, right? So I don't fill in anything for the rows. So I don't select any rows. It'll take all of them. And then I say comma one for the first um, column. If I then press enter, um, then it gives you this, this histogram, um, which doesn't show you much, but it shows you that almost 20,000 measurements were in the order of zero to like five to 10,000. And then you see that there's this very long tail. Um, we can use the breaks to add more breaks, right? So if I say, give me instead of, um, yeah, so breaks means how many of these bars do you get? So I get like one, two, three, four, five, I get like 10, 20 bars. Um, but if I say breaks is 100, um, then you will see that it actually makes the, the individual bins much smaller. Um, so I can see more what's happening. So I see that there's a whole bunch of measurements which are kind of off, right? There's no intensity. And then you see that, that the higher the intensity, the, least, that the less values that you get. But of course, this is just raw data. Um, and raw microarray data is the intensity of the probe. And of course, the intensity of the probe is not something that we directly want to model. Um, so the next step, of course, in uh, analyzing microarray data um, is to do some um, transformation. Right, so the first transformation that you always need to do when you are looking at microarray data is doing a log two transformation. And that is because when you do a microarray, um, light works in kind of an exponential fashion, right? So if you have two molecules, you have double the amount of light compared to when you have one molecule of, of RNA binding. And if you have four molecules, you have kind of a four times increase in the intensity. So a log two will kind of undo this um, exponential curve. Um, so what I do is I just say, well, take the microarray data and I'm using some shorthand here. So the apply function is a very, very powerful function. Um, it allows you to take another function and then apply this to either the rows or to the column of the matrix. So what this does, it's basically a kind of a little for loop um, which goes through each of the columns of microarray. And then what it does is it, it takes the log two of the column and then hemp because now you start off with a single vector of values, you take the log two, and it does that for each column. So you get a matrix back, which has the exact same dimensions. Um, so I can show how that is done. So in R, um, hemp, it just does it almost instantaneously. So I say apply to the microarray, um, two uh, means the columns. So for each column, apply the log two function and give me back a new matrix, which then stores this data. So if I want to just look at it a little bit, right? So I can say, well, give me the first 10 lines of the microarray file. Then these are the original values, which you also see in the, in the data set. Um, if I then look at the microarray log, um, then it shows now that the values have been transformed into their log two counterpart, right? So if I would compute the log two of this number, then it should end up being 13.93. So if I just do log two of this one, um, then indeed you can see that it, that it matches. Good, so the next thing is then to see how does the distribution look like now, right? So to see if our distribution it has become more normal because it, it kind of got rid of this exponential step. Um, so again, we do the same thing. So we, uh, um, and the nice thing is in R, you can use the up and the down arrows to switch 
um, between like the previous lines that you already had. Um, so if I go up right and I go to my box plot function, then now here I can just say, well, instead of using microarray, um, do a box plot of the microarray which have been log transformed, and again do the LAS is two so that the the names are um, vertical and not horizontal, and CAX dot axis is zero point seven means that the text gets a little bit smaller out otherwise the text would fall outside of the margin so if we do it like that then it seems already a lot better right because now the you can see that the average of the microarrays is around 10 ish um, you see that some microarrays still have some outliers on the top um, some outliers on the bottom um, but you can see that it already looks much more like a normal distribution um, because had the the, 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 me, uh, the median is in the middle then you have to 50% of the data is in the box and then 95% of the data is between the two vexes. Um, so this is a so that's what a box plot means. Um, if we want to look at it in a histogram, so just take a histogram of the first one. Um, so just say microarray log, take the first column, um, give me again 100 breaks, um, then the histogram now starts looking like this. Right, so you see that it starts to be kind of a normal distribution hey you still see that there's a little hump here and um, so it doesn't seem like a perfect normal distribution but they're still a little humpy um, hey it's not perfect so it's kind of a dual normal if you would look at it like this and hey, there's like one normal distribution here and then overlapping with another normal distribution here so the first normal distribution seems to have a mean of like seven and a half and the second normal distribution seems to have a mean of around like 10 or just above 10. Right, so but it looks already a lot better, right? So if you want to do statistics um, and you want to use like <clears throat> powerful statistics, so you want to use things like um, Pearson's correlation or you want to use like linear models, um, then one of the assumptions in these kinds of models is is that you have a normal distribution. So you have to get rid of this weird kind of Poisson-like distribution um, and you have to transform it. So in this case, and for microarrays, you always do this. So microarrays are always log transformed and um, then you get a more normal distribution. All right, so the question was here, um, let me look it up quickly. So make a box plot with and without. Um, so what does the LAS parameter do? So the LAS parameter, I already said it, um, let me, show you the box plot again. So the LAS parameter um, flops the axis from being horizontal to being vertical. Um, so hey, if we say LAS is one, then we can see that the names are horizontal. LAS is two means that the that they are just uh, vertical. Um, next question was, what does the uh, CAX does axis parameter mean? So that just blows up the text to make it more uh, or bigger or smaller, right? And if we want to check that, then we can say, well, make it 2.7, right? And now you see that the names of the of the axes are really, really big. Um, so that's what the CX does. All right, so before we can start normalization, we need to log to transform. So we already did that. Um, so redo the box plot on the log transform data. What is the difference? Um, so um, let me show you my answer. So this is kind of how I, um, when I do my assignments, I always do it kind of like this. So I, I give the code, I make the box plots, and then I just write the answers as comments. So every line in R which starts with a hashtag is a line which is ignored by the R interpreter because it's a comment line. So the answer to question 3a a, a is that the range of the data changed a lot. And now the distribution also looks more okay for, for the plot, but it also is more normal, right? So we can see that from the box plot, but we can also see that from the histogram. Um, why do we log transform microarray data? So this is because um, the PCR step is there to amplify the original signal exponentially. So it has to do with the way that probes work um, and it's just a common thing to do in microarrays. So it, it has to do with the, the PCR step um, before. All right, so now we can start normalizing. Um, so to normalize, we are going to use an external package called preprocess core. Um, unfortunately, and I tried this today, you can't use the standard install packages function anymore. Um, the preprocess core package has actually been removed from the standard repository um, that R uses. Um, so you have to get it from Bioconductor, um, which means that, um, let me show you the code for that. Um, so 
you have to now do a like a uh, to install this package um, you have to kind of use this magic incantation um, so if you have not got the package installed then first you it checks if you have bio the if you have the bioconductor manager installed um, if you do not it actually installs it from the standard repository and uh, this is because like the cron standard repository for r has like 2000 packages in there um, but it's really hard to get your packages on cron because they have very strict demands on packages and help files and these kinds of things. So uh, bio, uh, Bioconductor is uh, another repository that you can use um, for packages and they are just more relaxed in their packages and they also allow you to update packages more often. Um, so a lot of people switch their package from cron to Bioconductor, especially packages which are updated very frequently. Um, the whole process of getting it accepted on CRAN takes around like two weeks um, and putting it on Bioconductor is just sending an email with a new version of the package and then they directly update it within like 24 hours. Um, so if you did not have the package installed then um, this is the kind of magic incantation. So instead of using the standard install packages function which you can use to install the bio Bioconductor uh, Manager, um, you can use the Bioconductor Manager to install the preprocess core package. So I do library preprocess core because installing it just puts the data, or not so much the data, but it puts the code that the package uses on your hard drive, but you still have to make it active. So you still have to activate the package um, so that all of the functions that are inside of this package become available to you. Um, so that is what the library call does. So the library call opens up the library and gives you access to the functions in there. Um, so let's do that. Let's go to R um, and let's load the library. And if everything goes well, you don't get an error or anything. Then the next one is, is to take the log2 microarray data and um, do a um, normalized quantiles. Right, so normalized quantiles means that I want to get rid of some unwanted variation and like we could see in the uh, in the box plot and let me make the box plot better. Um, so what we can see in the box plot is that not every microarray has the exact same distribution, right? Um, some microarrays, the, the average is just a little bit lower. And if you would just start doing testing, so if you would just say, well, do a t-test of these three samples versus these three samples, you would find that there are a lot of genes which are differentially expressed. And this differential expression doesn't come from biology, it just comes from the fact that the first two microarrays just had a little bit more um, RNA put on them uh, compared to the last two microarrays, right? So the, the mean of the microarray tells you more or less how much sample was put on, um, and the variance is also uh, determined by um, other factors like the amount of or the temperature or the air humidity um, when you do the microarray experiment. So that's, that's one of these things that we want to get rid of, right? So we want to make sure that every microarray has the exact same average when we look across all of the 20, 22,000 probes. Um, so to do that, we can use the normalized quantiles function. I was looking at R again and I didn't show you guys R. That's bad, right? Um, so here, again, if we look at the first two microarrays, we can see that the mean of it is slightly above 10. For these ones, the mean is slightly below 10, right? So if we would just do a t-test between the first three and the last three, um, then we would find literally thousands of genes being differentially expressed. So to prevent this, we, we need to normalize, making sure that the average of each microarray is similar between all of the different uh, microarrays that we're using. And we need to make sure that the variance also is the same. So the normalized quantiles function will normalize the quantiles um, for us. Good, so let's do that. So um, again, I define a new variable. I just say normalize quantiles and I put in the microarray log. Um, data structure, right? So the, the matrix holding the log transport microarray data, and I just store it in a new variable called microarray log Q norm for quantile normalization. Um, the thing is, if we do this, and let me show you in R, that the original matrix, right? Uh, the microarray uh, log, for example, if we look at the first 10 uh, 
um, rows and we can see that the original data has row names and column names um, but if we look at the microarray log Q norm then we see that it doesn't have right so in the process of normalizing what it did it just remove the call names and the row names. So to prevent that from happening, um, what we do is not so much prevent it from happening, but we're just going to fix it afterwards. And fixing it afterwards is just saying, well, the column names of the microarray log are the column names of, or the microarray log Q norm are the column names of the microarray log, and the same thing for the row names. So we're just putting the row names and the column names back on the object. Um, and this is something because the normalized quantile function doesn't deal with the row and the column names. Um, generally, to prevent this, you would actually just put the object back into the matrix that it came from, overriding the original values. But since, since I want to keep the original object, I just fix it by setting the row names and the column names back. Okay, and then we make a box plot to check if that the normalization went uh, went okay and that everything that we expect to happen happened, right? So after um, log two uh, transformation and quantile normalization, hey, we now see that every microarray has the exact same um, average expression. Uh, we also see that the maximum value is similar for each of the arrays, and this is similar on the lower part, so the lower um, value is also the same. So it 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 removed. Um, and so what it did, it for each microarray, it just calculated the mean and then kind of subtracted the mean out of the data, and it did the same for the variance. Um, so I think in the R course, actually, I do it live, so I kind of write my own normalized quantiles function. It's not that hard to do. Um, you just calculate the mean and the standard deviations, and then you use that to transform your data, um, just like a log two transformation. All right, so have what was the question is, um, the question was that what do we observe after log two transformation or after normalization? Um, so after normalization, have what is the major difference? Um, well, the major difference is now that we can see that the range of the data is similar for all samples. So every sample has the same average, every sample has the same variance, um, which means that now we can start more or less analyzing our matrix. So first things uh, that we might want to do, um, and these were some of the additional questions, is that you might want to define some clusters, right? Because the clusters is the thing that we're interested in, because we are interested in um, how different these samples are from each other. Um, so if we go to R, right, we see that we have several microarrays. So um, we have um, 6013, 6014, and so on. Um, and we want to know how different these measurements are from the other ones, right? Because it might be that there is already some structure that we can easily see, right? And of course, you can think hey, if these first three were done on brain and the last three were done, for example, on, on fat tissue, right? Then of course, there should be a very big difference between brain and fat tissue, but within the fat tissue, stuff should look very similar to each other. So making a simple cluster plot um, allows you to kind of reason about the data and reason about what's going on. So the code I gave you guys in the assignment, so the code was actually um, a little bit difficult because what we want to do is calculate the distance. So, and the distance function is for some reason different than the box plot function. The box plot function works on the columns, but the distance function actually works on the rows. So because we want to know the distance between the microarrays, we first have to transpose the whole matrix, which means that hey, if you transpose a matrix, you just put it on its side, more or less. So the, the columns become the rows and the rows become the columns. So because the distance function actually works on the rows, we have to put the matrix on its side because we're interested in the distance between the different microarrays. So that is what the T function does. So the T function just takes the matrix, puts it on its side, and then the distance function calculates for each row the distance to the other rows, and then we use the haklust function to do a, a hierarchical clustering. So it just is a unsupervised clustering method, and then I just save the result from the from the uh, super or for, from the unsupervised clustering method into a, a new variable called clusters, and then of course we can just use the plot function to plot these. Um, so. Let's see what happens after um, have we 
uh, after we have normalized our data. Um, so let's go back to R. So what happens is that we see something like this. Right, so we can see that there are kind of two groups in our data. Um, we see that two of the samples, so 8013 and 8014, are relatively similar to each other. And we see here that the other four microarrays are also relatively similar to each other, but they are not as similar as these two are to each other. Right, because you can see that the height, so where, uh, for example, this sample hits the tree to the other three. Um, so this means that this sample has around 140 differences and or different units, right? Because it's not really differences, it's different units. Um, and have here we see the same thing. So these two microarrays are very similar. Um, these four microarrays are also very similar to each other, um, but there is a big difference between these four and the other two. So and that's something that we learned that there are two groups in our data two microarrays are very similar and the other four are also very similar but less similar to each other than the other two. All right, let's go back to Notepad++. So the answer was that there are two major groups in our data. Um, one contains two microarrays and the other one contains four microarrays. And then I ask you guys to do something complex, right? Because since we don't know the grouping in this data, we don't know if it's a three versus three experiment or if it's two versus four, we can't use any statistical testing, right? So we can't do a t-test or build a linear model. The only thing that we can do is look at the genes which are highly variable. So how do I define highly variable? So the way that I do this is I use the apply function again, and this time I use the microarray log qnorm dataset I go through each of the rows and then I say function X. So this function will be executed for every row of the matrix. And inside of this function, the row will be called X. And that is something that I define myself. I could have also said, call it Y or call it row or call it M row, right? So I can choose the name of how I want to call the row inside of this function, but I called it X. So what I then do is I say, well, okay, so I want to know how variable a gene is, right? So, but I also need to take into account the average of the gene, right? A measurement, uh, when I have measurements that are uh, 10, 11, and um, nine, then that is less variable than something which goes from three to four to, to two, right? Because the, the, the bigger the numbers, the higher the variance, becomes anyway and that's just because of a measurement error um, so had I just say give me the scaled variation so scaled variation is defined as the variance of x defined by the mean of x and x here being every time one of the rows of the microarray um, that I normalized all right so let's run this um, it should be relatively quick because it's not the biggest data set <coughs> so when we now look at scaled uh, scaled variation, right? So the, the object that we just created, and I'm just going to look at the first 10, right? So 1, 2, 10. Um, then it looks like this. So it tells me that the scaled variance of the first probe is 0 0.006. Um, the next probe has a higher scaled variance, which is 0 0.009, and then the third one has a even higher scaled variance. And then the fourth one is lower again. Right, so I can just say, well, okay, so I'm interested across all of them, so just do a plot, right, so just give me some graphical, and then you see something like this, right, so you see that there's a, that there are, like, across the array, we have our 22,000 probes on the, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we see the scaled variance, and so the scaled variance starts off for many probes being relatively low, so that means that these these probes are targeting something which is expressed equally in all six of the arrays. Um, but you also see that some probes are targeting things which are very different between the different arrays that we have. And that is shown by having a high scaled variance. All right, so the thing what we wanted to do then is see if we want to get all of the genes where the scaled variance is higher than one. So the way that we can... Oh, uh, the way that we can do that is by just saying so okay so we take our vector called scaled variance right those are just the values so for each 
probe on the array, there's one value, and then I just say, well, give me the ones which are higher than one. And this will give you a true false vector, right? So this will just, for each element in the vector, will test if the value is higher than one, and if it is, then it's true. If it's lower or equal to one, it will say false. So to, to kind of make, uh, so instead of, so I can, I can show you guys how this looks in R. Right, so if I would just execute this little part in the middle, right, so scaled variation higher than one, um, if I would do that, then you see that it will just run uh, for each probe, it will say if it was false or if it was true, right? So these ones were all lower than one. Um, can I find one which is higher than one? Not really. Right, but since I'm not really interested in um, for each element to know if this thing is true or false, um, I use the which function. So the which function just gives me the index, so which rows actually have a scaled variance higher than one. So I can just say which, and which scaled variance higher than one, and now it will tell me that, oh, there's a very limited one, uh, amount of, of probes that actually had a scaled variance above one. And that is true because when we look at the plot, we see that there's only a couple um, which have a scaled variance above one. Um, so hey, in this case, uh, row number 4,231, has a scale variance higher than one, and this is the name of the row. So if I'm, if I don't want to know the row numbers, but I just want to get the names of the probe, then I can just say names, right? So there are in total 21 probes which have a scale variance higher than one, and these are their names. All right, and then of course I want to store this, so I want to store this in something called highly variable um, variable or something like that, right? You can pick the names of the variables yourself. That's up to you. So you can all just also just say it's uh, H, HV, but I would always advise people to make names, speaking names, right? So have, have, have the name of the variable mean something, like um, temperature in Celsius is a much better variable name than just temp. Right, because temp can mean this is a temporary value, it's a temperature value, but then you don't know. So head like, and it's not bad, right? Because long names are more meaningful to other people looking at your code, but it also is good for yourself to remember what you were doing, right? And in R, if I type high and I press top, right, then it actually auto completes the name for me. So I, it doesn't matter that the name is long. It, because you don't have to type the whole name anyway. Um, all right, so let's go back to Notepad++. So what do we want to do? And then what I wanted to do was just make a heat map, right? So I take from the microarray log Q norm, so from the normalized log transform data, I take the genes or the probes which are highly variable and then just ask R to make a heat map. Um, so let's see how this looks. So let's just go to um, Notepad++, uh, let's go to R, and now we see here the genes and we see their expression across the different arrays. So here on the on the x-axis we see the different array names and here we see the probes that we have selected and here we see then a clustering. Um, so hey, what we can see is that these two arrays which we already previously identified that they were very close to each other also in the highly variable genes, they show that they are relatively close, right? A gene which is high in these two tends to be low um, or lower in the other ones. So the more intense the red color, the higher the, the, the similarity um, and the, the lower the color. So the more white the color, the more different they are. All right, so what was then the answer to the question? So have we observed that the, grou the groups that we saw before, right? Because if we look at the R window, uh, we can indeed see that there are two arrays which are very similar to each other. And then we see that there are four arrays which are also relatively similar to each other. Um, but now we also see some more structure here, right? So we see kind of that there are two microarrays done which are similar, then there's another two microarrays which are very similar, and another two microarrays which are again very similar to each other. Alright, so that was the kind of initial look into the uh, into the into some of the microarray expression data. Um, hey, it's a first look. Um, there will be more kind of examples like this, um, but it's just for you guys to have a little bit of experience in R, um, because I do think that it's important that we 
that I kind of get across the, the importance of being able to program as a bioinformatician, right? As a bioinformatician, you need to be able to program. So you need to learn a programming language, be it, be it R, be it Python, C or C++. Like in the end, it doesn't matter in which language you learn how to program. Um, but learning how to program is more or less essential. But since the course is about introduction into bioinformatics, um, there's no real time to teach you guys how to be programmers. So that's why we kind of look um, at the individual databases. All right, are there any more questions about the assignments? Um, if not, then um, I think we should uh, start with the lecture. Just gonna wait a little bit. So if someone has a question and just throw it in chat. Um, I will show you guys for now the Gliederung, so the, the overview. Um, so the overview for the rest of the day will be um, me talking a little bit about history. Um, we will talk a little bit about structure of proteins, about purification and identification, function prediction, like protein domains, how do we figure out which part of the protein does what, and then we will talk about protein families and terms like ortholog, paralog, senologs, and these kinds of things. Good, see no, no questions in chat, so then we will start with the history. Um, although it's 146, what do you guys think? Should we do a break now or should I do two more slides? Um, for me, it's egal what we do. Um, but uh, if you guys have very strong opinions, like, oh, I want to have a break now. Two more slides. Ooh, that's a big thing. Like, I probably can do one more. Two more slides. Genie88 for you. I'm okay to God. Continue. All right. How's the folding going? Oh, right. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Um, let me show you guys that. It actually finished. It actually finished. Very good. Thank you for reminding me, Misha. Um, so the folding is the answer, or the result of the folding is here. So here we see the uh, sequence that we gave it. Um, then here we see kind of a more graphical overview using like opening and closing arrows where it tells you the structure. So hey, the structure for a computer looks like this. And so that means that here you open up and you open up and you open up and then at a certain point parts of the protein are closed again. Um, so the results for the thermodynamic prediction look like this. So we see that um, it looks like a um, can I zoom in a little bit? Yeah, I can zoom in a little bit. Um, so here we see indeed that, that there is some structure to the RNA molecule of the spike. So and not only the protein has a very distinct structure, but also the RNA has a very distinct structure. You can see actually that there's a lot of blue and green. So it was actually pretty good at predicting um, the structure inside of the RNA. And you can see here that in biology, things always revolve around structure, right? Sequence is just sequence, but sequence folds in a certain way. Like the, these are real molecules and the molecule structure has the function. And you can see here that the spike protein, uh, the spike, the RNA coding for the spike protein has a very distinct structure itself as well, um, which of course makes it able to be transcribed by the ribosome. Um, we see a slightly different structure. Um, well, it's relatively similar uh, when we look at the, uh, the, the other prediction that it does, which is the centroid structure prediction. Um, but you can see, of course, that there are differences in the two prediction methods. And so it uses the uh, MFE prediction. This is the first MFE prediction. And then here we see the centroid secondary structure prediction, um, which predicts a little bit more like circular structure and less of these kind of hands on the side. Um, so very good. So we can actually download them if we wanted to. And uh, here across uh, we see actually the, the, the kind of a representation of the difference in the different predictions. So in blue you see the centroid prediction and in red you see the MFA prediction. And then in green you see kind of the, the how well the prediction fits between the two. And so the, 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 the higher the, the green line, the, the better the two predictions are getting towards each other. 
So an interesting tool, um, it works really well for very small um, RNA molecules, but you can see that it also works for, for bigger RNA molecules. And of course, his structure is everything, so structure determines function. It's kind of, instead of having form follows function, it's more like function follows form when we talk about biology. All right, good. Let's do a history slide. So when we talk about proteins, right, the, the, the history of proteins goes back way, way further than the history of DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA are relatively novel molecules that we discovered or uh, that uh, the, for in the biological molecule world, like we knew about proteins like 100 years before we knew that even DNA existed. So in, in, in like 1800, um, it was first determined that um, proteins are a distinct class of biological molecules. Um, so had when, when people started analyzing samples like chicken eggs and had they looked at these things chemically, um, they saw that indeed there were different fractions. And so when you would, for example, do um, a little, um, uh, when you do when you do different chemical tests, and then you can see that there are different fractions or different parts which make up uh, cellular fractions. Um, so in in 1838 we have the first description of proteins. So the first description of proteins, of course, is a description where they say, well, there's this egg, and if we if we take the substance which is in the egg, hey, we have something which is not calcium, hey, but we have something which is kind of fatty, so we have a fatty fraction, but besides the fat fraction, we also have a fraction which is different. So it's not fat, it's not sugar, um, but it is a kind of protein-like structure, and had the, the term protein was also coined back then in 1938. So people knew that proteins were a different structure, um, or that were a different type of biomolecule, right? So they knew it was not fat. Um, hey, it, the end of the 1800s, we also discovered uh, nuclein, um, so had the nucleic acids like DNA and RNA, um, but had proteins people couldn't really do a lot with because they are like massive molecules, right? They are sometimes like hundreds and hundreds of amino acids big, um, or even thousands of amino acids, and separating out those different amino acids from each other to kind of hint at the structure was very difficult. So people knew that proteins existed, they knew that they had biological functions, so that they functioned as enzymes, um, that, but like they also couldn't really purify them properly. And like um, insulin was only purified like in the 1920s, um, and um, had that very difficult. So for almost a hundred years, nothing really happened. The big discovery came in 1985 um, when X-rays were discovered. Um, so um, Madame Curie discovered X-rays, and uh, by using X-rays on protein mixtures, people figured out that x-rays might be the key to kind of unlocking proteins and learning more about the structure of proteins not just the structure but also their function so in 1912 we see that they the first x-ray diffraction experiment starts happening so what happens with an x-ray diffraction experiment and we will talk about this more um, but and very basically what you do is you take a protein, you purify it as best as you can, and then you make a crystal out of it. So you make a, a little crystal out of the uh, out of the protein that you purified, and you put this crystal, you put it on a on a on a kind of pedestal, and then you shoot x-rays at it. And you have a plate, so a, a photosensitive plate behind it, and when you do this, you start seeing very specific patterns. So if you take different proteins and you do different crystals of these proteins, you see that when you shoot an X-ray at it, you get a diffraction pattern, which looks completely different for every protein that you look at. So after these first X-ray diffraction experiment, um, nothing really happened for a long time, but it, or a long time, for a, long, a couple of years. Like in 1926, people discovered that proteins are actually enzymes, so that they can catalyze reactions, and that they are involved in things like uh, glucose homeostasis. So that, that, that if you are uh, diabetic, then you are missing a certain protein, um, and have people kind of realized that proteins were the kind of the workhorse of the cell, so that they are enzymes catalyzing chemical reactions and that you can have a chemical reaction and if you add a protein to it, this chemical reaction runs much quicker or it runs um, in a different direction. 
1933 we have the theory of the secondary structure of proteins. So the X-ray diffraction experiments told us that proteins are made up of very simple building blocks which are more or less in different configurations, right? So it kind of led to the discovery of an amino acid and that a protein is more or less made up of different amino acids that are chained together forming a protein. And that's what you see from the X-ray diffraction experiments because when you do an X-ray diffraction of a protein crystal and the protein is not too big, uh, then you see, for example, very specific patterns and these patterns come back between different proteins, right? So if you have the X-ray diffraction of an alanine, uh, amino acid and then of course this diffraction pattern also occurs in other proteins but not in all because only the proteins that contain alanine have this very specific pattern and from that they deduce that there are around 26 27 different patterns uh, which continuously occur and that, so that's their idea they got the idea that okay so a protein is a very big molecule but it's made out of 24 to 26 very distinct subunits and these subunits they actually called amino acids so um, in 1933 we have the the theory of the secondary structure of proteins so, so people then started to realize that the way that these these amino acids are more or less chained together allows a protein to have a different secondary structure so that that proteins are more or less folded back onto itself and that you see that a protein has a very distinct secondary structure and that this structure is related to the function that the protein has. In 1946 we have the development of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging um, and had that actually allows you to see proteins function um, nowadays. So nowadays using NMR we can make very detailed scans of proteins and we can actually see proteins more or less moving uh, when they are catalyzing their chemical reaction. In 1949, we have the synthesis of insulin. So hey, insulin is, of course, the, the magic substance that um, helped diabetic children to not die. So before, like, 1920, when you actually were diabetic, um, there was nothing that people could do. So they would just put you into a hospital bed and you would just, in the course of like six to seven weeks, just wither away. Um, and not being able to take up food, um, not being able to get glucose into your cells. Um, and of course this was horrible because like a lot of children actually died before 1920s um, because they had no way of treating diabetes. So hey, if you have type 1 diabetes, you can't produce insulin at all. Um, there's a there's very much literature about it. So if you're very interested in the history of insulin, which is like one of the miracle drugs at the beginning of the 19th century, um, then do read up on it because it's a very interesting story with three different scientists who were all uh, kind of fighting with each other in a way. And like in the end, it's good that they actually never patented their like extraction method because otherwise a lot more people would have died. Um, but the synthesis of insulin is a big step forward. Before 1949, if you needed insulin, um, then the only way to get insulin was to find someone who could chemically kind of extract or purify the insulin protein, um, and that would be extracted from bovine um, slaughterhouses. So have someone would go to a slaughterhouse where they slaughtered a lot of cows. They would get all of these pancreases together. Um, they would squeeze more or less all of the protein out of the pancreas. And then there, there would be a purification step purifying the insulin uh, from the bovine uh, um, uh, pancreas. But in 1949, actually, they developed the method to chemically synthesize insulin, uh, which means that you didn't have to go to the slaughterhouse anymore. 1958, we have the first protein structures being unraveled using uh, NMR and X-ray diffraction. So at that point, we, we started kind of having an idea of how proteins really look like. Um, so they're, they're quaternary structure, not the, the secondary structure or the tertiary structure, but really the quaternary structure had to, to see how a protein works. So in 1964, we have uh, crystal electron microscopy. So uh, it's very similar to crystal X-ray. Um, so, but um, here you use an uh, electron microscope. 
1967, there's the first protein structure by X-ray, which has been determined. And then in the 1970, uh, we see the protein database being established. So the protein database is the database nowadays where if you're interested in protein and protein structures, uh, where you can literally find all of the information collected in the last 50 years um, regarding proteins and protein structure. In 1975, we got a really, or a new method, uh, and this new method is called two-day gel electrophoresis, and we will go into that in much more detail. Um, basically, what it allows you to do is it allows you to take a protein mixture of different proteins and kind of put it on a gel and see which proteins are there. So it allows you to separate proteins based on their mass, um, but it also allows you to separate proteins based on their charge, so their pH. Um, and this allows you to do, um, or this allows you to do like, a hundred people take blood from them, separate out the proteins and see if people who are sick have a certain protein while others don't have it, or if there's a difference in uh, the abundance of certain proteins. So it's, it's still one of the most commonly used methods when you want to look at like protein and proteomics. Um, but 1975 was the discovery of 2D gel electrophoresis. In 1976, we have the first visualization of a protein structure on a computer using, of course, the protein database. And so this is the first time that someone created a 3D rendering of a protein. Um, and in 1981, we have ribbon diagrams being invented. So ribbon diagrams are a way to kind of draw a protein uh, without having to go into too much detail, but still having an idea of what it does. And then, of course, in 1999, we have the ribosome structure. So one of the biggest proteins in... Um, in, in a human cell or in more or less any cell. Um, to, so at that point, hey, we were able to kind of take something which is 15,000 amino acids long and kind of make a, a structure. And of course, in the last lecture, we talked a lot about the structure of the ribosome. And this is only known for the last like 20, 30 years. And so all of this this knowledge that we, that we have nowadays and take for granted in a way is all relatively new um, and is something that we only discovered like 20, 22 years ago. And so we knew that the ribosome existed, we knew exactly what it did, but how it looked like was only discovered in 1999. All right, so that's it for the first hour. Um, I will stop the recording.